a little boy is laying in a hospital bed and his mother is caressing his hair. The mother is holding in her other hand her cell phone and as she plays with her son's hair and lays next to him, she is searching the internet for ways to kill him. Let me say that again. A mother is lying in the hospital bed with her son and doing a last-minute search to find the correct dosage of salt that will kill her son. As little girls and boys, we look up at the glowing angel that gave us life with love and adoration. But for too many, this is not a happy reality. For many, the woman holding us... I'm literally disgusted by this next case, but let's begin. Lacey has a secret. Lacey has many secrets. Okay, Lacey is a liar, and we are drowning in the sea of them. One account, two accounts, three accounts, done. Lacey has split her world into three audiences to play out three different lives. Each Facebook account will feed her the only thing Lacey needs. Likes, love, and sympathy. At the age of 19, many already know Lacey to be a perpetual liar. Those who went to Decatur High School with her, her friends, and even her family have given up on her, and she is now feeling the coldness of her town. While at work one day, flipping burgers at Jack's Burger Place, Lacey meets cashier Autumn Hunt. Autumn Hunt needed a babysitter for her son, John John. She turned to Lacey, who was recommended by Kathy Hammock, a mutual friend who also works with Lacey at a daycare center. And she says that she is great with children, routinely caring for five babies at a time. She'd often open the place up at 5.30 a.m. and still be happy to fill in for others and close up around six. Lacey's world had a new meaning after meeting Autumn Hunt and John John. But it wasn't the friendship of Autumn that was giving it to her. It was the little boy that was in front of her. Lacey had tunnel vision for this little boy, and they were inseparable, and Lacey became John John's nanny. Soon, posts on MySpace were all about John John. Her post read, He completes me. The little blonde boy John John beams in dozens of photos of Lacey Spears' MySpace page. In the bath, at the park, sitting on the counter with a bright, big red pacifier in his mouth. The photos are titled, My World, My Everything, and He Completes Me. In one titled, A Mother's Love is Unexplainable, She's Kissing the Little Boy. When people told her how cute he was, and asked if he was her child, Lacey would say yes. When she moved out of her parents' house after high school, Lacey didn't go far. She rented a place a few hundred yards away in the Cedar Key Apartments. That's where many of the photos of John John were taken. Lacey would spend weekdays there with John John at a daycare and frequently take him home with her after work and keep him some weekends putting him to bed in a crib that she had a neighbor's assemble. It was a relationship that worked for both parties. Hunt wanted a sitter she could trust. Lacey wanted to spend as much time as she could with the curly-headed blonde boy. She would take him home with her from daycare, and on weekends, when she had him, if Autumn decided to stay out of town Sunday night, she'd say, fine, I can take him to work with me. Lacey and Hunt also spent a lot of time together. People actually thought they were sisters. If they had been sisters, that would have made Lacey Jonathan's aunt. But Lacey and John John spent so much time together that people believed that Lacey was his mother. A belief Lacey did not correct, and actively sought to promote. Riley Vaughn, an on-air personality at the Mojo radio show in Athens, got to know Lacey in Decatur in the way people do in a small town. Vaughn's son was born in 2007, a year before Garnet, while Lacey was caring for John John. 
She told everybody that was her son, Ron said. There were always pictures of him spending the night with her. Really, every day there were pictures of him and her together. People believed what they saw and were told, in person and online. As for how much Lacey was paid to be John John's nanny, Hunt said, I didn't consider her a nanny. She was just a friend of the family. No money was actually exchanged. When asked why she thought Lacey would do that, she surmised it, it was a way of Lacey to get attention. Being a teen mom, everybody's your friend. When Jonathan was born, people I didn't even know were coming to the hospital and to the house to see me. Having a child made you the center of attention for a short period of time. That very well could have been the case with her and Jonathan. A friend of Autumn saw one MySpace photo and asked Autumn Hunt, Isn't this your son, John John? Autumn went to look, and there was a picture of Jonathan. And in the comment under the picture, Is he yours? And Lacey replied, Yes, he is. He's the love of my life, and he was born February 14th. When Hunt confronted Lacey, she admitted it and apologized, saying, I love John John. I would never do anything to hurt him. It was just a little off-putting to have her do that, Hunt said. It wasn't okay. Hunt began making other arrangements for John John's care. I just found it too odd. We were both posting pictures of the same baby. Decatur's not that big of a town. It wasn't too long before Lacey fell into a deep, dark depression, but all that was about to change when she targeted her neighbor, Chris Hill, downstairs. Before he met Lacey, he would joke about her. He lived alone at the Cedar Hill, but visited regularly by his ex-girlfriend, whom son they share custody of. He said they would sit in the parking lot and watch Lacey walk quietly up the stairs without expression to her apartment. We used to make fun of her and called her the predator. She was so quiet, you'd really have to stop her and jump in front of her to say, hey, 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 for her to talk to you. She was cold and antisocial. She was another breed altogether, like nothing I've ever dealt with before. One day, Lacey knocked at Hill's door to ask a favor. She asked me if I'd put a baby crib together for her. During this period, Lacey was caring for John John, a friend's baby, and would often keep him overnight and on weekends, Chris mentioned. In fact, she told me and friends that John John was her own child. I started putting it together, and she started asking me personal questions. I think she was lonely. I hadn't seen anybody go up there in some time. I think she just wanted attention. In the days that followed, that attention became sex. We hooked up for a little while, he said, between gulps of a 22-ounce Bud Light at Logan's Roadhouse in Athens, a chain restaurant where patrons eat peanuts from a bucket and toss the shells on the floor. The relationship lasted a few months, and then Lacey broke it off, he said. Soon after, she told Hill she was pregnant. They talked about marriage, even started looking at books to find a baby name. She said, I like Garnet. I said, no, let's keep looking. We were acting like we were a couple. I was trying to get her to marry me and to see if we can make it work. Then something happened. Lacey changed. She went from wanting to be married to saying, he's not your kid. He said, I can't tell you why. I can tell you why. You told Lacey she couldn't do something, like name her son Garnet. That wasn't part of her plan. In fact, your part of the plan was now up. Garnet Paul Thompson Spears weighed 6 pounds 14 ounces when he was born on December 3, 2008, in Huntsville Hospital. The birth announcement in the Decatur Daily lists no father. It was the first indication of a story brewing, a way of throwing Hill off balance, pushing him out of the picture, denying him access to the baby she was carrying. In the years that followed, Lacey Spears told friends and even the slightest of acquaintances that her soulmate and Garnet's daddy was a police officer named Blake, who died in a car accident. Mention of this soulmate on social media had Lacey's Alabama friends scratching their heads. Blake was never in any pictures when Garnet was born, but she was crying about him on Facebook posts, saying he was the love of her life, that he was always there for her, Wiley Vaughn, who's 26, who knew Lacey when she lived in Decatur, said, That's why I stopped Facebooking her. I was just done with her after that, after realizing that most of the stuff she was saying just wasn't true. Chris Hill 
wasn't in any of the pictures when Garnet was born, either. In fact, he never met the blonde and bubbly little boy his mother called Garnet the Great, even though Hill lived one floor down from Lacey and the newborn boy. He would catch glimpses of him when he and Lacey were coming up and going. We had already split up, and she was saying he wasn't mine and to leave her alone. I only saw her and him when she would get out of her car to walk up the stairs. I would hear her car door shut and hear him cry, and then I would look out of my window to try and get a look at him. Hill said Lacey threatened to call the police if he didn't keep his distance. At the same time, he said she was infatuated with cops. If he said he had talked to the police about something, she would grill him about which officer he had spoken to, what he looked like. He vaguely remembers Lacey mentioning a man named Blake as an ex, way before me, care, but certainly not a soulmate, and certainly not Garnet's father. Friends don't recall Lacey having a serious boyfriend at Decatur High, home of the Decatur Raiders. Hill can't explain Lacey's change of heart, stopping any talk of marriage all of a sudden. She just acted like I didn't exist. She just ended it. She just wanted to be a mother and not have a father involved. Shauna Lynch, a 30-year-old woman, went through the same thing that Autumn did. Lacey was spending too much time with them and her kids and overstayed her welcome. Shauna recalls hearing Lacey talk about a miscarriage that she had before the birth of her son. She just said, I used to be pregnant and the baby passed away. Lynch said, recalling the conversation with Lacey before Garnet was born, I was like, okay, do you want to talk about it? And she said, not really. And I kind of left it at that. Now, Ginger Dabs Anderson was another close friend who would have Lacey and Garnet over to her house. And then at that same time, Lacey had posted on Facebook that she was at Blake's house at the time when she was over at Ginger's. How could she be with Blake? I think it was a made-up picture, a fabricated situation that that wasn't even his daddy. His daddy and I met him. He lives in Decatur. His name is Chris. The internet, specifically social outlets, became Lacey's way of communicating with the world because they couldn't see the truth. Motherhood, though, wasn't as easy as Lacey thought, and she became tired and unable to deal with Garnet, always fussing, always unable to deal with his tantrums. She started to join forums online and reached out to other moms for support. And then the floodgates opened. Suddenly, everyone cared about her. Garnet had spent more time in the hospital than not. He underwent a surgery to prevent him from throwing up at four months. And when Lacey reported that he wasn't holding any food down, he was diagnosed with failure to thrive. And he then had a feeding tube put in. And you know what? It was only after Lacey had gone from doctor to doctor, after them telling her there's nothing wrong with your child, that she went and found another doctor until they believed her and actually did the surgery. They put a feeding tube into the child just based off of the mother's information, not off of another doctor's recommendation. Now, as a mom and having gone through my own son being sick, I remember that I had to do these searches um, because it was my first time dealing with what he had and it was everything was very unexplained for me. So I would type in unexplained illness and what kept coming up was Munchausen by proxy and it would talk about moms who would fabricate these illnesses and cause pain and this is when I started becoming more fascinated because how on earth could a mom hurt their child, inflict it. I can't even stand for, to watch my son get a needle, you know, to get blood drawn. I just like, I can't see him hurt. And for you listening, I'm sure you feel the same way. So for a mother to go in and have their child have unnecessary surgery, like in the case of Lisa Schofield, Dee Dee Blanchard, Lacey Spears, all of them perpetrated the same lie for the same reason. I just can't wrap my head around that. Okay, let's move on. When Lacey moved to Florida in 2010 to live with her grandparents, Shauna kept in close contact on Facebook, as always, and thought it was strange, though, that she had never met the father of Garnet. I was a little shocked, honestly, she said. 
but again, it's none of my business. After the move to Florida, Lacey became friends with the neighbor next door, Kim Philipson. Kim Philipson would watch Garnet from across the way and said that he seemed like a very happy and healthy little boy. Then, once in a while, Lacey's parents would appear, and she would watch Lacey get up and leave, and she would stay away the whole time. Kim suspected that something was off, particularly with the father. Then, Lacey would tell her biggest lie yet when asked about her father. She told Kim that Garnet's father was also her father. Kim, at this point, did not know how to help Lacey, and Lacey swore her to secrecy. And then, not too long after, Lacey was running up to Kim on the lawn, crying, saying that she just miscarried another child by her father. Kim did what any human would do and ran over to the house against Lacey's wishes and confronted the mother. And the mother threw up her hands and did not want to hear what Kim was saying. Moments later, the grandmother was out trying to find out what Kim was doing. As Kim was screaming, the grandmother was trying to calm her down. And finally, Kim heard what her grandmother was trying to say. She said, no, no, none of this is true. Lacey has a problem with truthfulness. Do you mean Lacey is a liar? I think by now we all know this. Unfortunately, Kim was yet another victim. It's not quite clear why Lacey felt the need to tell that to Kim and not expect her to have such a reaction. Unable to handle living, now in that situation, Lacey does a desperate search online for a place to live and finds a fellowship. Her stay in Florida, though, before this, really seemed to be working out. Rebecca Paulson and her husband both agreed that Lacey was indeed a very doting mother. The Paulins said Lacey was into healthy eating. She bought garnet specialty foods and organic stuff. Still, Rebecca Paulin remembered that the change in scenery from Alabama to Florida didn't end the reoccurring ear infections that had landed him in Alabama hospitals in the first couple of years. Her husband recalled that garnet had a tube in at least one of his ears. But even through that, the Paulins say that Garnet was a very happy child, who had just turned two when they arrived, and was just about four when they headed north to Chestnut Ridge and the Fellowship community. Lacey learned about the Fellowship in part from one of the Clearwater families that she babysat for, Jack and Nicole Plial, whose three children she watched. Lacey moves to the Fellowship and she feels safe, she feels connected, and nobody knows about her past there. But no matter how far you run, guess what? There you are. Next thing you know, she's bored and starts stirring up the pot in the fellowship. She tosses a few lies about people to get them to hate each other, and she also throws some accusations at some of the men, and life is just like she never left home. Luckily, she has her little man to rescue her from it getting too bad, and she knows that just one trip to the doctor and everyone is back on her side and understanding her and all the stressful things that she's going through. Lacey moved to the fellowship shortly after Hurricane Sandy, and then 14 months later, Garnet was dead. And his mother, whose Facebook page was flooded with prayers as she documented her son's excruciating final days, now finds herself being investigated in his death. She was in my home taking care of my three children, Nicole and Jack, who were members of the fellowship, said. I did not see anything off. She cared deeply for her son. If there was something majorly off, we would have seen it. Nicole's husband spoke of Garnet's death as Lacey's second tragedy. She lost her son. She lost her husband. He said, noting Lacey would speak very lovingly of her husband, who Lacey told them was a police officer who had died in a car accident. She shared details with me, Nicole said. I have no reason to disbelieve anything, she said, and she did say he was a police officer. As the new year began, on social media at least, Garnet appeared as happy and healthy as ever. Gone was the barge of images of Garnet's hospital visits that seemed to consume his earlier years. 
On January 11th, Lacey posted a photo titled Breakfast by Candlelight. Garnet sits at a candlelit table set for breakfast, his trusty owl cup next to his plate, and then the next day began a downward spiral that would end his life. Duly recorded on Facebook. In 28 posts over the next 11 days. In them, Garnet goes from being sick with the flu to having seizures to being on and off of a breathing tube. On January 19th, Garnet was flown from Nyack Hospital to Westchester Medical Center, admitted to Children's Hospital Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. In a fourth post that day, Lacey says Garnet was put on life support. Over the next several days, she reports on Garnet's sodium level and that he's in screaming pain. On January 22nd, she shares that she plans to remove life support the next day. Garnet declared brain dead, she says. His soul is already with the angels, and I'm not ready to let him go. Then, in her last post on January 23rd, Garnet the Great journeyed onward today at 10.20 a.m. On the surveillance camera in the hospital room, you actually see on the video Garnet dying. Who could do this? My brain was screaming when I saw this. She did it. She took her son's life. Lacey Spears went into the bathroom after her son was given a clean bill of health and she gave him a lethal dose of salt and sat there and watched him die. She sat there and watched him die. I'm so sick. I'm so sick of this woman. How can the attention of social media be greater than the love of your child? I want to know. Garnet was airlifted to Children's in New York. The nurses had no explanation of what just happened, and they had to bring the police in. And they notified them of the spike in sodium. Detective Carfee came right away and questioned Lacey while she was in the room with Garnet. If she was giving him any medications, he wanted to know, and she played dumb in telling them that she gives him so many things. There were 150 medications found in her room. The police called Kim and she told them everything. Lacey has a truthfulness issue. Autumn Hunt would later say that knowing there was an investigation into Lacey's parenting has caused her to re-examine things that she didn't give a second thought when John John was in her friend's care. One is that John John would routinely get severe ear infections during the next year while Lacey was his caretaker and stopped getting them shortly after. His ears would actually leak pus, Hunt said of John John. He developed a hole in his eardrum. After he turned two, there was no longer any issue with his ear problems. Hunt said she trusted Lacey completely and never suspected Lacey would do anything to intentionally harm my child. Doctors, she said, never made her feel that repeated ear infections were at all unusual. Garnet would also repeatedly suffer ear infections so severe he would end up in the hospital. Autumn Hunt has a hard time thinking ill of Lacey and wondered aloud, how do you cause an ear infection? When Chris Hill heard from a friend that Garnet Spears was dying at Westchester Medical Center, he reached out to Lacey in the only way he knew how. He sent her a Facebook friend request. Then he waited and waited. It's a strange way for a father to seek news about his son, but Chris Hill tried it anyway. He had never met Garnet hadn't seen Lacey since shortly after 
their boy was born five years earlier. Lacey had taken him from Alabama, where Garnet was born, to Florida, and then onto Rockland County's Fellowship community in Chestnut Ridge. And now, Garnet Paul Thompson Spears was dying nearly a thousand miles away from Hill. And Hill was waiting. On January 23, 2014, the day Garnet died, Hill went on to the public part of Lacey's Facebook page, copied a photo, and shared it on his page with a status update. This is my other son, Garnet, and he is five years old. I never get to see him because his mom just up and moved to New York. Well, Friday, he had some severe seizures that caused his brain to swell, and now his brain is dead and on life support. Even though I don't get to see him, I feel like he's been with me this whole time. I'm not going to lie. I cried for hours when I found this out, and it will continue to hurt till the day I die. And still, he waited for Lacey to click on an icon on Facebook to let him back into her world in the smallest way, a way that would open dozens of other photos that she shared with her friends, including graphic photos of Garnet on his deathbed. Lacey had spent the boys five years chronicling life on Twitter, MySpace, and Facebook. Police began digging into all the stories that Lacey was telling everyone, and they decided to investigate the 26-year-old mother in the death of her five-year-old boy, and stories that won her sympathy, prayers, and attention from an online circle of friends who followed her efforts to raise her sickly son alone and to make him well. A week after Garnet died, Lacey accepted Chris Hill's friend request on Facebook. The wait was over. They started texting and had a couple of phone conversations. Years had passed since their brief physical relationship, but the two communicated as two grieving parents who had just lost their child. Lacey laid to rest the idea of Blake. I need you right now. She texted on February 18th. This is our son. On February 19th, she texted, Chris, you know we will always be a part of each other's lives for the rest of our time here. We have a son together. We may not have worked out, but now we both need each other. Friends, at the very least. Do you agree? In other messages, Lacey texted her pain. I want G back, and I feel okay at moments, and then it hits me like a thousand pound weight. I want to die. Lacey also noted the police investigation. I know they are looking at me, she wrote to Hill on February 20th. I would never hurt my baby. In one text, Hill asked Lacey about the news reports that suggest police are investigating whether Garnet was poisoned with salt. He writes, Did they tell you about a salt deal? Lacey replies, What? Salt? What does this mean? Then, just in disbelief, Hill comforts her, then asks why Lacey lied about Garnet's father being a man named Blake who died in a car crash. I wanted to protect Garnet, she replied. Everything I did or said was to protect him. Then it was discovered that in 2009, on June 20th, DHR received a call from the Morgan County Health Department reporting that Garnet and Lacey Spears were en route to the Decatur General Hospital to Children's Hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. Child en route to hospital with bleeding from the eyes, nose, mouth, and ears is how the call log reads. Dabs Anderson, a friend of Lacey's, would now recall the incident that made her question Lacey's fitness as a mother. On one of the dozens of hospital visits, Dabs Anderson said Lacey tried to convince medical staff that Garnet had thrown up by pointing to a wet spot on the hospital sheets that turned out to be water. She kept telling medical staff that the boy wouldn't eat 
and asked them to surgically implant a feeding tube that would allow her to feed him without having to swallow. When they declined, saying he ate well under their care, that he was able to keep the food down, Lacey took Garnet to another hospital where doctors implanted the tube. I'm a nurse, and I've been around Garnet, Dabs Anderson said. I didn't think the feeding tube was necessary because when he was with me, he ate formula or baby food or any type of food. He didn't have a problem with throwing up. Several of the emergency room visits went beyond feeding issues. He was getting ear infections a lot, said Dabs, who told the police investigating Garnet's death about them. Bad, terrible ear infections. I felt suspicious about that. I didn't understand how he was getting ear infections like that. He even had staph infection in his ear. Autumn Hunt, who trusted her son, John John, to Lacey's care, also remembers Lacey frequently bringing Garnet to the hospital with ear infections and digestive problems. Hunt recalls Lacey being upset once when the hospital held Garnet overnight and wouldn't let her stay over. They wanted to see if he had the same symptoms without Lacey. She didn't learn the outcome or any conclusions that were drawn from that overnight stay. Riley Vaughn had a child a year or so older than Garnet, and among a circle of friends who would hear Lacey's stories and want to help. She told me Garnet was born healthy, then went into surgery for acid reflux. She said he almost died a couple of times because of the surgery, and that's why a feeding tube was required. I believed all that and donated a bunch of toys and clothes to her for Garnet because I felt bad for her. Dabs Anderson, too, took an interest in Lacey and Garnet outside the hospital. She didn't know how to be a mother, she said. That's the only reason I was friends with her, because I thought I could teach her how to be a mother. What to do for him and how to love him and take care of him. Garnet would do overnights at the home of Dabs Anderson, and I would get Garnet and bring him back here and then babysit him. The former nurse said, and he would eat with us. When he got older, like one or so, at the dinner table, and I would feed him whatever he could chew. He ate fried potatoes, mashed potatoes. He ate with us whatever we had for dinner. He loved fried okra. One time, he was so hungry, so I went to McDonald's and got him a Happy Meal. He ate it all. Dabs Anderson said Spears had a fit when she saw him eating the Happy Meal. Not approving of fast food. At bath time, one stabs Anderson said she saw Lacey force her toddler son's head under water. She held him down in the water because she was flustered with him, upset with him, because he was whining when she was washing his hair. She was complaining about him pouring water onto his head. I mean, babies are going to do that. I jumped on her, and I made her stop, and I got him out. I got him dressed, and I took him with me. She considered it a momentary loss of temper and didn't report the incident not to the police and not to DHR. I thought I could deal with it. I just thought she was just overwhelmed. Lacey shared her connection to Dabs on Twitter on November thirteenth, two 2009. After work, I'm going shopping with my two loves, Garnet and Ginger. The bathtub factored into another incident, one that Lacey herself reported online. Last October, according to her Facebook friend, Kathy Hunt, who read it on a now-closed account called Happy Hippie Mama, Lacey shared that she had lost her cool with Garnet, that he had screamed and she had screamed, and that she told him in the bath not to touch the faucet. And when he did, she wrote, that she ran the tub full of cold water with him in it and made him take a freezing bath. She said she felt terrible and asked for forgiveness. I was a little shocked when I saw that because I thought she was the perfect mom, Hunt said. The world thought that Lacey was a perfect mom. Police were able to retrieve from Lacey's phone that while she was lying in the bed with her son, that she was googling hypernatremia. 
high doses of sodium. I think for her last show, she wanted to put Garnet into a coma so she could have the best of both worlds, at least in the world she created. After Garnet's death, Lacey moved in with her parents in Kentucky, where she held a small memorial for him. Lacey's friends, who responded with prayer to her post about Garnet, were confused when news reached them of police investigation. Some friends had begun an online fundraiser and raised $800 to help Lacey cover medical bills, but suspended the drive and refunded the money when they learned of the probe. That little boy was her life. She was finding a way to move forward without her reason to live. All of these were posts on Facebook. That's all she ever wanted to be, was a mother. Last week, Lacey posted a 545-word status update in which she declared, I will always be Garnet's mother. I will always be a mother. Nothing will ever change that. But who am I today? That I don't know. The youngest of three children born to Terry and Tina Spears, Lacey was born October 16, 1987, and was raised in a single-story ranch home on Cedar Lake Road. Lacey Spears was sentenced to 20 years to life for administering the lethal dose of sodium that killed her son Garnet the Great. Lacey now spends the rest of her life in jail. This case, like many others that I do, are heart-wrenching. So I apologize for those who this does affect because I myself find it sometimes really hard to do these shows. I do appreciate all that who are listening to Monsters and Mothers. And if you enjoy listening to the show, give me a follow and I will know that you would like me to. Thank you for listening to Monsters and Mothers. Subscribe to hear more chilling accounts of mothers who commit unspeakable horrors.